from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. This is Carolina Week. Good evening. Welcome to this special edition of Carolina Week. I'm Courtney Robinson. And I'm Nora Warren. Tonight, a look back at some of the top stories from the academic year and a look ahead to what seniors have to look forward to after four years at Carolina. Outrage about the arrest of a campus icon continues to cause controversy across campus and it could continue until the fall semester. From protests in the pit to online petitions, we haven't heard the end of the Val Dowdy story. Reporter Ross Widener has the story. This was the scene in the pit Monday with students demanding that Carolina Dining Services employee Val Dowdy be cleared of all charges after her March 25th arrest. According to university police reports, Dowdy is charged with felony embezzlement of food for letting some students eat at Top of Lenore for free. Protesters say there's something else behind the arrest. We see this arrest as part of a larger campaign of illegal anti-union harassment and intimidation directed towards the employees from Aramark Management. UNC sophomore Michael Hashi led the protesters through Lenore, across the quad, and up the steps to South Building. After police tried to quiet the protest, Hashi handed a signed petition and a letter to Associate Vice Chancellor of University Relations, Nancy Davis. At a student action with workers meeting Thursday, Dowdy explained how students going upstairs would swipe their cards more than once to pay for their friends who were running late. She said she'd ask them, What's their name, baby? Or what color clothes they got on? And they'll tell us, me and Tina. And when they come through, they'd be like, well, this be such and such. I'd be like, yeah, baby, we already got you because such and such is already slapped for you. And they go on upstairs. Aramark released this statement. Upon Miss Dowdy's arrest on charges of embezzlement, Aramark placed her on paid leave. She has not been dismissed. These events and actions are not in any way tied to her alleged involvement with union organizing efforts. The protesters don't think so. They say merely speaking out in favor of unionizing landed Dowdy in the mess she's in. In Chapel Hill, I'm Ross Widener, Carolina Week. When we last spoke with Dowdy, she wanted us to give a message to the student body. She said, tell all the students how much I love them, and I hope I can come back. From lobbying for Dowdy to lobbying for a lottery, this is another polarizing topic that has people up in arms. Until this year, lottery bills have been voted down by every North Carolina legislature since 1983. But this year's $1.3 billion budget deficit raised the stakes a bit, drawing support for the, from the House for the first time. Mary McGuirt has more. Like many people, Durham resident Nathaniel Shaw has high hopes of one day hitting the jackpot. So at least once a week, he makes a drive to Virginia to purchase his lottery tickets. Owners of convenience stores in Virginia say this helps their business a lot. Almost 80% of our customers from North Carolina. I mean, we stand at number one in Virginia now. If it wasn't for North Carolina, we'd probably be nothing. But Shaw says he wishes the money he was spending would go to fund projects like education in his own state. I think we need to take our money and keep it in North Carolina. Supporters of a North Carolina lottery say money that could be going to help out North Carolina schools is going just across the state line to help out schools in states like Virginia. North Carolina has debated a state lottery for years. Governor Easley supported it during both his terms. But political experts say North Carolina's current economy has legislators wondering where else the money could come from. If they don't get the lottery revenue, then they're either going to have to cut budgets uh, more severely or um, put off some of the uh, advances in education. Not everyone's a fan of the lottery. Former legislator Chuck Neely leads the Coalition of Citizens United Against the Lottery. Even though he doesn't want a lottery, he says, I'm glad the speakers decided this is an issue that should be voted by the legislators and not by a referendum. That vote will determine North Carolina's chance for a lottery. But for now, Shaw's going to keep taking his chances across the border. I didn't win. On April 6th, the House passed a lottery bill with Democrat Bill Culpepper leading the temporary committee that developed it. During the U.S. invasion of Iraq, many of the Air Force missions left from Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Reporter Joe Mott took a trip out to see the men and women who work on one of the most fascinating weapons in the U.S. arsenal. 
The opening of one of the hangar doors on Whiteman Air Force Base, and Airman Christian Beck starts his day. This is the cowboy from hell. Though he still calls his cowboy a she, she's more formally the spirit of Texas. Beck is a crew chief on one of the only 21 B-2 stealth bombers, a jet that costs $2.2 billion. It's a job that can best be described quite humbly by Beck himself. Pretty much just the Jiffy Lube guy on a B-2 aircraft. Basically, Beck and his crew handle all general repairs on his plane. It's a job each crew chief takes great pride in, and something Beck's commander knows well. You, got, you see they got the names on the side of them, and uh, these guys really feel a sense of pride when they get their jet in the air, and it's going to do a mission. And different names on the jets aren't the only differences between them. Every jet has a different personality. This one, it's more, she gets an attitude if she sits down for a little while. The slightly antsy jet hasn't had any combat missions recently, and she allows those curious enough to have a glimpse. Like I said, this is the weapons bay. This is where the magic happens. Though no pictures are allowed inside the bay or the cockpit, a cameraless peek is, with rules, of course. You cannot touch this, 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 and that. When he's not showing guests around, he's keeping the cowboy in tip-top shape, which means checking for everything. Before and after every flight, Airman Beck puts on his white coveralls, slides down the air inlet, and checks to make sure that nothing is in the way of the engine fan blades. You, you know, bust your hump for about eight hours, jet came down broken, couldn't fly, watching that thing take off the next day, probably one of the best feelings you could ever get. A feeling that keeps Beck quite happy with his job. At Whiteman Air Force Base, I'm Joe Mott, Carolina Weed. Some of those pilots put their lives on the line for us. No, that's true. We often hear about the number of troops killed while defending their country. Reporter Natasha Vukulik got a first-hand look at what people don't see or hear every day, the lives affected by the loss of those troops. Ready. Ready. Camp Lejeune recently held a memorial for 15 Marines who lost their lives while serving in Iraq. Our hearts are ready as we confront the fact that 15 of our own have been taken from us. Corporal Jonathan Beatty was 22 years old when he died. His sister Heather says he was her best friend. He's going to be deeply, deeply missed because he's touched so many people's lives. So many people. Corporal Beatty's mother described her emotions in a letter. She wrote, Children are like very rare, precious jewels. And on the 27th of January, I lost one of my precious stones in life. For my family and I, we know in our hearts that our love for Jonathan will never die, and that we will one day see him again, just as God has promised. These are the boots, rifles, and helmets of the Marines who were killed in Iraq defending their country. The only thing missing are the dog tags, which hung right here. The families took them in remembrance of their loved ones. Sergeant Benjamin Edinger was another one of the Marines honored. Mazzero says Edinger could lighten up any situation. They needed him to get some rooms to clean up, and, and he just, just heard it and just left. And he thought they said booze. So he, he left and he's gone for a long time. He came back with beers for everybody. <laughs> the memorial brought out memories, tears, and laughter. As Corporal Beatty's mother wrote, Sometimes the best and most beautiful things in the world can't be seen or touched. We have to feel them with our hearts. At Camp Lejeune, I'm Natasha Vuklik, Carolina Week. UNC's Carolina Troop supporters have events planned throughout the year. You can check out their schedule by visiting our website, carolinaweek.org. Coming up, new age cleansers have become the norm for a quick hand wash. But those foams and gels might not be any better than an old-fashioned scrub. To change the world, you don't have to be rich or famous or play ball or lead countries. All you have to do is tell your family you want to be an orphan dog. Talk to your family about organ donation. Talk to your family about donating life.
In the past several years, we've seen a variety of products hit the shelves from manufacturers claiming products rid your hands of germs. But as medical reporter Philip Jones tells us, the most effective germ fighter might be handier than you think. An outbreak of the gastrointestinal bug norovirus at a UNC cafeteria last year sickened 240 students. Junior Stephanie Smoke was one of them. I got sick enough that I had to have an IV put in me. And that's when they finally said, oh, this is the Lenore virus. And um, the doctor said it was the worst case he'd seen. Officials from the Orange County Health Department say the problem started here at the salad bar in the top of Lenore, and that improper hand washing could have led to the contamination. During the outbreak, Carolina Dining Services installed waterless soap dispensers in the cafeteria. Although they remain, the issue of hand washing has faded from the spotlight. Carolina students might want to start reaching for the soap again, based on a research study done at UNC hospitals. Epidemiologist Emily Sickbert Bennett tested how effectively a variety of products removed viruses and bacteria from hands. She found popular waterless soaps like those in Lenore and on the shelves in most stores kill bacteria, but offer little protection against viruses. I think the best thing to do, really, if you want to clean your hands, is to go to a sink and wash them with plain soap or antibacterial soap, either one. People who wash their hands with plain soap and water removed between 90 and 99 percent of bacteria and viruses. Sickbert Bennett says hand washing is more effective than using waterless soaps because during hand washing, water physically flushes the germs away, something that could help prevent the spread of norovirus in the future. Because of her illness, Smoke now appreciates the value of hand washing. I do think it's important because if you think about it, anyone could sneeze or cough on their hands and then open a door and then you go to open the door and rub your eye or something. I mean, I think it could definitely make a really big difference. More so than fancy foams and waterless gels, simple soap and water could mean the difference between getting sick and staying well. In Chapel Hill, I'm Philip Jones, Carolina Week. Sickbird Bennett says if you can't get to a sink, using waterless soaps and gels is the best alternative. Doctors are looking for some alternative ways to help babies with autism cope better in society. As Carolina Week's Dan Casuto reports, doctors are now turning to some unlikely helpers. One of the most popular ads from this year's Super Bowl showed a monkey kissing another monkey's, you know. Although the monkeys in this ad can't seem to get down to business, Dr. Michael Platt at Duke University is using monkeys for a whole different line of work. Monkey social behavior might hold the key to unlock the mysteries of autism in humans. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman's character in Rain Man was sometimes violent, sometimes almost comatose, and never really in touch with other people. That's common for autistics. Dr. Platt wants to know why. So he showed monkeys pictures to test a normally functioning brain. Sometimes he showed them what a monkey might consider sexy, like a female's backside or a monkey's face, usually one who's popular and strong in the group. Then the researchers started bribing the monkeys with fruit juice. They wanted to see if the monkeys actually cared what they were looking at or if they'd give up fruit juice to see any pictures. We didn't need to pay them much juice at all to look at the hindquarters of females. We don't know whether they're really considering them as images or whether they see that as actually there's an individual over there a real live female. The monkeys surprised the researchers by also giving up juice to stare at the faces of other, stronger male monkeys. Dr. Platt says the submissive males were trying to keep tabs on the dominant males, what they're thinking, how they're feeling, and who they're mating with. Researchers think autistics like Rain Man, living in their own world, wouldn't care about that. Many autistics find it difficult or they don't actually engage in looking other people in the eye. The monkey's choices are helping Dr. Platt analyze a healthy brain. Eventually, that might help him understand a brain affected by autism, even if the monkeys are a little silly in the office sometimes. In Durham, I'm Dan Casuto, Carolina Week. Monkeys might be able to help us understand autism. But we know that groundhogs are supposed to tell us what kind of weather to expect, or do they? This Groundhog's Day, warm weather lovers are keeping their fingers crossed that no little creatures will see their shadows. I'm hoping for it to be spring. Do you think he's going to see his shadow today? Yeah. School kids flocked to Raleigh to learn how these animals survive the winter and to see their favorite local groundhog. I'm excited to be here because there's so many animals here and I didn't know they were going to be here. Here at the Museum of Natural Science, we've seen rabbits, snakes, and even salamanders. But Sir Walter Wally is the main event. 
It's a sunny day outside. Will he see his shadow? He's standing up. What is he doing? What's he doing? The groundhog did see his shadow. The groundhog tradition comes from the old days in Europe when people looked to badgers and beavers to predict the end of winter. When they came out, if they could still see their shadow, that was a sign that that was part of their death, and so they would go back to sleep. In Raleigh, Sir Walter Raleigh looks like he's ready for another nap. Well, even if you can't count on Sir Walter Raleigh's predictions, you can always count on unpredictable weather in North Carolina. Well, Wes, needless to say, it's been a great sports year, huh? Capped off by the National Championship in men's basketball, Wes Wilson is here to join us to tell, show some of the highlights of the year. Yeah, you were saying unpredictable weather. The football team was unpredictable this year, and the basketball team, well, some could have predicted that. But coming up on Carolina Week Sports, there's a saying in poker that goes like this. You can't lose what you don't put in the middle, but you can't win much either. Well, Carolina Sports goes all in when we come back. Art can be many, many, many things. The North Carolina Museum of Art offers one of the premier art collections in the Southeast, and it's yours to discover. There's something for everyone. Works by classic and contemporary artists, a 164-acre museum park, an outdoor concert series, performances, and so much more. Experience all that art can be at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Welcome back to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Wes Wilson. And as you can tell by this suit, you know, Las Vegas has been good to me. You'll find out why in just a minute. You know, you think what it, you, you have what it takes to go all in with the cards the Salvation Army wouldn't accept. Do you really think you can sit at the same table as the poker pros on TV? As sports reporter John Leggett found out, you might want to think again. I think it's just the television coverage that uh, started it. Um, I've been in poker for a long time, but uh, the World Poker Tour, I don't know if you heard about it. Heard of it? How could you miss it? Televised poker coverage is on four different channels at any one time. So to see what all the fuss was about, fellow sports reporter Wes Wilson and I decided to enter a free local tournament on Franklin Street. Now there's a saying in the poker world that goes like this. If you don't spot the sucker at the table in the first 30 minutes, you're the sucker. And the suckers bring out the sharks. Sharks like James Jones, who looks at poker like most people look at chess. I think it's just a strategy for me. Like it's, it's fun to sit down with some friends and have a good time. At the same time, you can uh, play a really, it's actually a very intellectual game. Strategy? I thought it was just about getting good cards. Looks like I might be in over my head. But for some, like Ryan Pascal, the reasons to play are much simpler. I don't know, it's just addictive. Um, there's a lot of excitement, adrenaline rush. I don't know, a chance to win some money if you're not playing here. It's a good thing we aren't playing for money. I haven't won anything all night. While Wes, on the other hand. I was just getting lucky, man. I haven't seen four of a kind ever, ever since I've been playing. <laughs> and with cards like these, that win you pots like this, it's hard to lose. Wes obviously had enough chips to stick around for a long time. My official time at the table? Only 29 minutes. Down and out in Chapel Hill, I'm John Leggett, Carolina Week Sports. Just as a follow-up, I've taken my good fortune to Las Vegas. Well, on the other hand, John Leggett has decided to stick to playing Go Fish. Madison Hedgecock has been through a lot during his four years on the Carolina football team. Now the colorful fullback is headed to the next level. Sports reporter Heather Catlin has his story. These are the sounds that Madison Hedgecock is used to hearing after dominating for four years in Keenan Stadium. But now his glory days at Carolina are over and he's preparing for his debut as a professional football player with the St. Louis Rams. Hedgecock says he's excited about playing in the pros, but also realistic. If you can play a long time, it's a good, it's good living, but NFL stands for not for long. While Hedgecock says he will miss contributing to the Carolina legacy, he says he'll miss those close to him the most. That's what remains, not the school, not what you learn here, it's your friends. And that's what, that's what you get out of this. That's what I got out of more. So before he leaves, he's training hard, the only way he and his friends know how. Well, it's all fun and games for Madison right now. In a few days, he'll be training with the best in the nation. Greatest show on turf. 
In Chapel Hill, I'm Heather Catlin, Carolina Week Sports. Hedgecock will look to plow the way for one of the best young runners in the NFL, the St. Louis Rams, Steven Jackson. The fall season of Tar Heel sports had just about everything you could want as a Carolina sports fan, from the highs of beating Miami and Keenan to the lows of losing to Duke in the NCAA field hockey tournament. Well, get ready because you're about to see all this and more. It will be the best three and a half minutes of your life. <laughs> It was a fun fall in sports, and that's before the real fireworks from March Madness began. You know, we'll have a look at that on another special edition of Carolina Week. Well, guys, as you could tell by the video that you just saw, it was a tremendous season for fall sports. That's true, and I'm already gearing up for uh, this coming fall's football season. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes. Remember playing with Yet Legos when you were younger? Well, some people in the triangle took those toys to a whole new level. Calling all Lego lovers. You won't want to miss what's coming up. <laughs> Mom tells me to eat broccoli, carrots, apples, blueberries, strawberries, green beans. I like to eat oranges. They have vitamin C. I like chicken and turkey. It gives you protein. I like to drink lemonade. Milk. Because milk makes you be strong. A lot of fruits and vegetables make you healthy. Make good choices so you'll be healthy. And it's good for you. Healthy living starts early with a wholesome diet and exercise. Okay, guys, time to take off. Five, four, three, two, one. Blast off! Wow. Whoa, look at that. Is that you, Biddle? Hey, kids, it's time to go to the planetarium. Yeah! Yeah! 
Moorhead Planetarium, where dreams become reality. This year marked a new beginning for Chapel Hill, and it's called Lego Palooza. Carolina Week reporter R.J. Weber shows us how much fun a few Lego models can be. Imaginations were running wild. A robotic guy that like transformed. And little hands were hard at work. <laughs> All thanks to thousands of Legos and one organization. Uh, North Carolina Lego Users Group. The group hosted the first ever Lego Palooza at the Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center on Saturday. So cute. Folks stood in awe looking at the hundreds of Lego creations on display. Everything from interactive astronauts to elaborate spaceships to entire Lego cities. And I can pretty much say that our group for its size is probably one of the coolest groups out there. <laughs> and it wasn't just the little ones who thought it was cool. Ooh, cool. Moms and dads were just as impressed, which made for a happy surprise to one of the group's members. Like everybody thinks I'm weird because <laughs> like most 15 year olds aren't building Legos. Not only were there displays like this complex motorized train on hand for folks to look at, children of all ages also had the chance to put together a Lego model of their very own. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The kids had their thinking caps on. Black, um, brown, and gray. Which made for some creative constructions and demonstrates exactly what binds Lego users together. A really good curiosity of what everybody else is doing. In Chapel Hill, I'm R.J. Weber, Carolina Week. Well, Courtney, it looks like we missed out on a lot of fun, but uh, they weren't the only ones who got a little carried away with construction. That's right. One Durham man has, to been, has, been building a little, has been doing a little building of his own. As Bryn Tuggle reports, it's not Legos, but locomotives that keep him chugging. Herb Fritz has what some might call an unusual backyard. Unusual because he has trains running through it. His train village started as a hobby, but soon became a passion. And despite the hard work, Fritz says it's something that provides a calm retreat for him and his wife. Well, it's a lot like the ocean to us. We can sit here and watch the water falls and the trains running. It's a very quiet, uh, relaxing thing to do on a nice summer afternoon. Fritz says there are many different parts of the village that make it unique, such as the waterfalls and bridges, or the detailed buildings that all have special meaning. A lot of the buildings are named uh, specifically for members of the family or uh, things that we've seen or done in our lives. The village is called Fritzerland, named to rhyme with Switzerland, a place the Fritz family has enjoyed visiting. Fritzerland took five years to build. It consists of 800 feet of track, 14 trains, and countless hours of enjoyment. And the members of the Fritz family aren't the only people who get to enjoy Fritzerland. Fritz's neighbor, Elizabeth Sharp, says this is the first time she's ever had a neighbor she's enjoyed visiting so much. Oh, I just think it's so much fun to have a neighbor who's nice and has a very nice looking yard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fritz enjoys Fritzerland just as much as everyone else who sees it. He says it's been a hobby well worth his time. In Durham, I'm Bryn Tuggle, Carolina Week. Nora, Fritzerland looks like a child's dream. It looks like so much fun. I wish I had one in my bedroom. So do I. The only thing that I had was these little wooden blocks that you had to move yourself along the track. Nothing that moved on its uh, own. Yeah. That looks awesome. We missed out. <laughs> well, that does it for this special edition of Carolina Week. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night. Good night.